Thank you, Peter. My name is Jem Bowden, and today I will be hosting Room One with my colleague, Ellen Korovic. We are education consultants at the Mathematical Association of Victoria, and we're so excited that we can be with you here today after the interesting year we've all been through. Today, we will be your room hosts. Our role will be to introduce presenters and sessions and answer any questions and answers via the chat feature if needed and pro provide any announcements. If you have any questions, uh, technical questions, we may or may not be able to answer them, but feel free to put them in the Q&A um, feature. If you have any other technical issues, please check your confirmation email for troubleshooting and who to contact for support. So let's begin. This is room one and our keynote presenter for this room is my good friend and someone who I admire in the educational math setting, Dr. Paul Swan. Dr. Paul Swan is a mathematics educator who works around Australia and the world. Although being based in Western Australia, he is an award-winning author, game designer and consultant who works with leaders and teachers to promote the best outcomes for children. One of his grandchildren has started preschool prep this year, so he is keenly interested in harnessing the enthusiasm and excitement for learning that she shows. Paul is based in Perth and has pre-recorded his keynote. However, we'll be online, and I've said good morning to him this morning, so he's here now with us, even though it's 10 past six in WA, to answer any questions during the presentation via the Q&A chat feature. I would now like to welcome Paul. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak uh, this morning. I appreciate it, uh, even though it's remotely. Uh, certainly, we hope that you'll get something from the presentation. And just uh, before we start, um, there's a couple of things you might want to uh, bear in mind. If you happen to have some counters, uh, maybe some dice and some dominoes available, that would help. And also, uh, we put a few extra support materials on the web, which you can download ready to uh, use in, in this session. So you'll notice that they come up here at the bottom of the PowerPoint, where you can get the list of uh, materials and support. So just to get us into the topic for today, we're really focusing on young children. And we're going to look at that, that sort of group of, you know, sort of four to eight year old period and looking at sort of picking up or developing on the curiosity, the natural curiosity that children have uh, when they come to school. And we're going to talk about this notion of engagement. Now, I put a little quote there from uh, Lewis Carroll's work, uh, and I always like to sort of focus on some of that sort of thing, the notion of being curiosity or being curiouser or curiouser. So I'll just move into the presentation. I just need to tell a little story here. Essentially, I'm sure we'll all uh, bear this in mind, uh, sort of COVID lockdown, and we certainly had a little bit better in Western Australia than you've had in uh, Victoria. But um, my granddaughter was uh, at home and getting a bit bored. And so I had made up a little packet of materials for her to do in terms of mathematics. And uh, good old granddad decided that he would do a Zoom lesson or some Zoom lessons just to keep it going. Now, bearing in mind that my granddaughter is just going on five, so around that five sort of mark. And so I tried to have some appropriate material for her. And so one of the little activities I had in mind was to use a, a board, a hundreds board, do a little bit of counting work and so forth. So I'll illustrate the activity I had in mind, and then we'll just talk about what she had in mind. So I'll get you to look here, and I've got a calculator ready here, and you can just see what I was planning to do. So stock standard on a calculator, you can get it to count. So for example, if I press plus one, equals 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 you'll notice that the calculator is counting and so my idea was to get some counting happening maybe with her counting along with it maybe then writing it down and so forth now linked to that i then had this hundreds board and so my idea was that uh, basically as you pressed and counted you put a counter on there and show the, the development of counting well that was what granddad's idea was and remembering i'm not dr swan i'm granddad at this point here um, Essentially, her idea was different. And so if you go back to the slide, you'll notice that uh, now I've got it. This is a bit of a recovered version of it. What she was interested in doing was literally seeing how far she could write her numbers. Now, that might seem boring to us, but essentially she was saying, I wonder how far numbers go on. Now, there's a few issues there and numbers turn and I managed to rub a couple out by mistake. But you've got the notion here. Her idea of an engaging lesson was to see how far she could go in her numbers. And so we then had a bit of a discussion about, well, I wonder how far numbers go. So you see, the teacher will have one idea in mind, 
but often the children have a slightly different idea in mind. And so that takes us to our next slide, really, just to get some thinking going about the, the, the balance and the idea that would happen here. So we, we've got in the title of this, thing, this uh, discussion, the idea of engagement. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, Dr. Catherine Adhard's the expert on that, and I've listed at the bottom her, her website about engaging maths. But she has a very simple idea about you've got three elements or three domains there. You've got the notion of the cognitive domain, and that's really developing the deeper understanding, the reflection or the thinking. You've got the effective domain, which is fairly obvious, but the, the notion of really valuing the mathematics thinking about how this impacts on me, where I am, and, and where I'm going to head with it perhaps in the future. And then you've got the operative idea, which is the, she doesn't just call it participation, she refers to it as the active participation, being involved physically and so forth, not just looking at you. Now, if you put all those three things together, you'll get that middle bit. Can you see that bit about engagement? And so that's what we mean when we talk about maximizing this curiosity of young children to get that engagement. So let's, let's look a little bit further and we'll give an example of that. And I just want to talk about the balance. So if we just look at the next slide, you'll see that we've got a little bit of a balance that's happening here. And this is trying to get it sort of right. So we've got this notion of what I'm going to call play with a purpose. So let's go back to the story of my granddaughter and what I had in mind for a lesson and what she had in mind for a lesson. So do you notice I had a teacher planned idea probably a bit more structured than she had in mind. She had a child initiated idea. And so you start to see there's the unstructured, you know, and then the highly structured. So my granddaughter was at the child initiated bit. She wanted to do the numbers and so forth. And I wanted to, to do the calculator bit and count. Now, sometimes that can form a little battle of wills, but I really needed to think, she's five years old. She's really interested in this idea of counting, whether it goes on. So it was actually better for me to build on her child initiated play and then just by adding a few questions, building that curiosity about, I wonder how far numbers go. Do they go beyond this and so forth? So we start to see how we're maximizing. And one of the key bits about the maximizing is building from what children are really interested in themselves. So we're building this idea of this effective domain. And then what we're doing now is saying, well, through the use of questions, we build and build and build and build on that idea. So let's just follow this sort of idea through and that'll sort of run through the presentation and just give you an idea. There's another balance that's going to go on. So if we look at the next uh, slide, we'll start to see here, there's another issue that's going on here and that is that every child is different. So here I am working one-on-one -on -one with my granddaughter who I knew fairly well and I've got a little bit of a relationship there. Now, for the teacher in the classroom, it's a much harder issue at this point here because you've got a number of children and you've got to work out where each one of them might be. And so I've just pulled this idea, you know, people call this by different names, but here's the example, the zone of optimal confusion. In terms of here, we have a level of engagement that's happening, which we talked about before. Now, engage children. Now, if we make things too easy after a while, who cares? I'm bored, this is so easy, I could have done that, you know, etc. So it's it's about the idea of finding that sweet spot where it's just a little bit more difficult. I've got to think a bit, I get a little bit confused. Now the sweet spot is a very difficult idea because for one child it's different to another. And that's where the teacher comes into play because you just know the level at which to cajole, add that little extra question, focus that little thought in a particular way. If you push too far, you'll get this total confusion and then it's, I'll oh, give up, oh, it's all too hard, frustration, all of that sort of thing. So if we just go back to that picture that we had on the slide, you'll see there, so we've got a point of engagement, so I've got to get you interested. Then for learning to start to take place, I've just got to take you that next little step. If I take you too far, I get frustration, frustrated. Now, the bottom line is sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we do make things too easy, sometimes too hard. And that's a very difficult thing because a teacher has to do that while the lesson is going on. In other words, in football terminology, they have to read the play as they go. So at this point here, we're trying to find this zone of optimal confusion. So we'll build that idea into the rest of the presentation. But they're the sort of main theoretical ideas that we want to build on here. So let's take a little step further and let's look at the next uh, slide. And 
basically this is picking up on a lot of the work that Dr. Catherine has done and she refers to this pedagogical repertoire. Now I'm not going to read this slide to you and so forth but you notice there's a few key points happening here. There's about positive tasks, there's about a level of success but we've got to fit that challenge. There's the notion of a bit of an element of choice. Now when my granddaughter was doing that, she had the element of choice because she wanted to write those numbers. Um, sometimes it's hard to explicitly link things from the classroom to real life because when you're only six or seven years old, sometimes their experience of real life is limited and so forth. So essentially, I quite like that little list. And once again, you can uh, download that from Dr. Adhard's uh, website. But a notion there that just do, the, do that little running checklist of this thing, this piece, this piece and so forth and just see how engaging our task might be. So let's just head a little bit further along and you can follow along. Here's a children's book that we're going to look at. Um, so lots of people would say, oh, children's literature. That's a neat way of us engaging children and getting them involved. And you're at a, a MAV conference. Uh, the Maths Association of Victoria would have probably the best uh, and largest selection of children's literature that you can get. So uh, I would suggest that you have a look at uh, some of their books. Now here's one. You'll find this, uh, it's fairly about 12 ways to get 11. It's a lovely book and uh, you can probably find online, but it's worth buying. Now at this point here, my curiosity as an educator has already peaked at this point because I'm thinking, is that true? Are there 12 ways to get 11? And that starts to get us thinking. So from a young child's perspective, we might just have some counters. So let's just have a look at this process. Now, essentially what I've done now is I've just rearranged those counters. You can see so a bit easier to see that we've got 11 because we need to make sure that we've started uh, with the right number. Now at one level, remember the thing, the book title was 12 ways to make 11. Um, you might do things like, well, we're going to do 10 and 1. We might do nine and two and so forth. And that's fine. That would get us thinking and moving. But if you actually open the book, what you'll find in it gives you various ways to make 11. So I'll give you an example. If we head back down here, uh, I could have two, two, and I could then have seven. So that's a three partition or three part point. Now, if you start thinking that through a little bit further, hmm, now I'm thinking, well, only 12 ways to make 11? There may be many more. Now, for some children, it's pretty good if they've got nine and two makes level. I'm very happy. But if I want to stimulate that child to use their natural curiosity, they'll have to start being systematic in about what they're, they're doing. So they'll need to think, well, so I've got two parts and then I've got maybe breaking the three parts and so forth. So if we look at the next uh, slide, you'll see how we might get some recording. So there's the standard two parts. But what about, you know, one and one and one and one and seven and so forth. So you see how we took a book, you know, a simple idea, take a children's book, a bit of literature. Now on the website, you can download a stack of those books. As I said, MAV has a bundle of them. But just think about how you can just go that little extra step, that mile, we might say, just to build the curiosity and get them thinking about that. So that's one idea that we wanted to build in. But I just want to take us a step further there. So if we just go back on and have a look at the slides, we'll just go a, a little bit further. So we've considered that idea. There's our set of books that you're welcome to download. They've got some uh, curriculum links and so forth and explanation. So essentially, you know, at, at back at school in terms of staff meeting and so forth, maybe you have some of these books. Just think about how you could ask the next stimulating question because but remember, we're trying to find that zone of confusion. So we want some engagement. We want to get us into that slight zone of confusion. So engagement would be the ways to make 11. The, the zone of confusion has to be, whoa. So I was thinking just two parts, but in fact, three parts, four parts and so forth. What we need to be careful of is not to lead to frustration. Now, sometimes just having like the counters that I had um, will just help you with that sort of idea to, to build that. So let's work on the next idea a little bit. So essentially, remember, we're aiming to maximize engagement. So let's have a look here. We're going to talk about games. Now, once again, I'll quote some research. You, know, we sh you should be familiar with that because James and Toby Russo and Leisha Bragg are situated in Victoria. And they wrote a lovely article, which is the five principles of what they call educationally rich mathematical games. Now, there's games, 
But what we're talking about here is one of some games that are going to stimulate this curiosity and build the thinking a little bit. Now, the reason I've used this article is you go online, you can download it. So if you wanted to do a bit of a professional reading or so forth, it'll give you this idea. And they basically put five principles there. Now, once again, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but the first principle is about engaging the, engaging the students. So it needs to be a game that engages that stuff. Um, there needs to be an element of skill, but also there's that balance with luck and so forth. We also know how to bring out the mathematics. So, for example, I always reserve the right. So that's a nice game, but I like to ask the question, so where's the mathematics that's sitting inside that game? So essentially, when you're choosing a game, because lots of people use games for that engagement, if we can keep those principles in mind that, you know, um, Toby and James and Alicia have talked about, then that'll be a good criteria for us to think this through. And as I said, feel free to download that at a particular time. Now, I just want to share a game or two, and they won't necessarily fit all of those principles in one hit, but let's sort of whiz through some of those principles here. So here's a game. Now, what's interesting here, Megan is my niece. It's like I'm talking about my whole family today in this sense. But I want to share this game now. It's interesting. She called it a B-O-R-D game, so bored. Um, I hope she wasn't too bored, B-O-R-E-D, uh, in doing this. What had happened was I had made a, a series of board games, literal board games, and I wanted to test them out. And uh, Megan was the right age, so she became the victim of all this sort of thing. Now, here's the side bit that happens here. If we look at Megan's game, she said, well, actually, I'm interested in designing my own game. So it's a bit like my granddaughter. She started with what I wanted, but actually moved to something else. Now, uh, essentially, if you think about it, if I design the game, I know the mathematics and I've done all, a lot of that work. Basically, it's just a lot of sort of skills sometimes, things there. However, when the child designs the game, there's a heck of a lot of thinking, which is what we want to focus on. So let's go back to Megan's game. You may not be able to read everything on that game but essentially what she got was little sticky labels glued them on moved them in different spots now Megan was doing quite a bit of counting thinking forwards thinking back and so forth now when Megan explained her game to me basically um, there was this particular approach so approach one was Megan would always go first and so we'll take you through a set of slides now to just take you through the progress of what I call Megan's game Okay, so step one was, she didn't actually roll a five, I need to be up front with you. Uh, she plonked a five uh, onto the uh, table, and the idea was basically this five bit. So now I want you to think about how those bits of paper that she's stuck on there, she's now worked out that I've got to get to this point. Okay, now I'm thinking, oh, no, she's gone up nine spaces. But if you look at what happens when you've got nine spaces, look what happens next. She goes up nine spaces and it takes you to the place that says go back 10 spaces. Now, start thinking about what she's doing. She's planning ahead, she's working forwards, but she's also working backwards. Because when you go up nine spaces, look what it says, go back 10 spaces. Well, when you go back 10 spaces, guess what? It then says uh, go to the finish. And essentially, so the game was really engaging for Megan, not so engaging for me because I actually never got a turn. So if you think about that, Megan goes first, she's rigged it, so land on five, and essentially that the, the game's over. So engaging for her. Now, what was the engagement for her was the designing of the game. And if you really think about it, there's a lot of thinking going kind of into that in terms of that sort of spaces. Now, Megan at the time was only about five or six in that sort of bracket. So the, the thinking involved there was that. So let me just share a couple of other games that I just wanted to... Uh, play with you just briefly to illustrate the same sort of ideas and how something just builds and builds and builds and builds. Now, remembering about the notion of being uh, those principles uh, that we mentioned earlier, the five principles of, of, the, of the game there. So we'll pick that up. Now, here's a little game that I just designed for really about somewhere about three and a half to four and a half, that sort of age range. And I'm going to share a few little bits that I learned from that. Now, my purpose in developing the game, the mathematics in the game, is this notion of subitizing. So essentially, I'll just put you under the visualizer and we'll just have a bit of a, a look here. So essentially, I have two pocket dice. Now, if you're not sure about pocket 
the dice. Essentially, I literally have a pocket in there and you can slide things in and out. Okay, so you'll start to see that. Now, I just had some notions here. Here was the first mistake I made. I put on there the word hop. Now, and those of you who teach these young children will realize that to ask children to hop is a pretty well disaster. So I taught this game to um, some children and, you know, the first time they couldn't use it. You can see sort of how that slides in. They couldn't hop. But I, I'll tell you now, in about three or four months, their hopping was pretty good. But when they started, they were crashing into each other. I'm sure there was a little faked, but you got the notion. However, that's the action. So I call this action maths and call it whatever it was. So the action might be jumping. Um, oh, here's the other one where I made a mistake. Yeah, I'd click on here. Well, we had to change that to wave uh, because the clicking just didn't work. But there were steps and so forth. However, this is the action. But actually what I was interested in, in was this. So basically one child got to be the role of this. And I tried to use some non-standard subitizing patterns. And you start to see here, so how many steps are we going to have? So that's five steps or so many jumps. Now, the other mistake I made on here somewhere, uh, we've got spin. Okay, so you'd imagine when a lot, young child does five or six spins, they're all over the place and so forth. But here's a really simple game, but the children were engaged because it had that action. They were actively participating in it. So let's fast forward a little bit and let's move into a slightly different uh, part of the school. So I was working in a school and the year ones have to learn to tell time to the hour and the half hour. And look, there's a bundle of different games we could make to do that. But what they were really struggling with was the idea of clockwise and anti-clockwise. And so uh, basically you design a little game, which we'll talk about here. And essentially same pocket dice. And I'll just show you an example here. So we've got the word clockwise. Okay. And then we put some numbers. Doesn't really matter what numbers on this one here. Now I'm going to bring up a slide and I'll describe this, if I was there physically and we could stand up in a room, we'd do this as a group. So we'll have a look at the slide. So this is another sort of action game for one of the better thing. Now, I'll give you the three elements there. You've got there's a pocket dice. Now, you might have the words clockwise slid into five of the pockets and just one pocket is anti-clockwise. So because I wanted to focus on the idea of clockwise, little children don't mind if a dice is biased. And then you have some numbers. Now, what those numbers are, you would put the numbers depending on the age of the children. But can you see, basically, we're forming a circle. That's, uh, I don't do the circle song, but you got the, the notion of what might be there. And essentially, we give a bean bag, just one color bean bag to one student. Uh, that student, we roll the dice, we're going to go clockwise. Which way is clockwise, children? So we did a big thing about what clockwise is and so forth. Now, how far are we going to go clockwise? So imagine that we've just done five, for example. So the bean bag has to pass five. We count five. So one, two, three, four, five in the clockwise direction. Now, if I counted the five, um, here's what happens. If the bean bag lands on you, okay, basically this is a bit like a duck, duck, goose type idea. You drop the bean bag and you have to run around the circle in a clockwise direction. Now, when you play this with adults, they don't like getting the bean bag. But when you play it with children, they love getting the bean bag and running around. So we literally have some action or some participation. Now, we played that game for a little while and the children love it. And my idea was that we would develop the idea of um, clockwise, building the clockwise thing. But I need to just share what happened in this game. So after a while, you know, the kids are pretty good at this sort of thing. And so now I'm going to talk about this sort of zone of confusion and just adding another element to, to what it is. Okay, so in this case here, uh, what we have is I started stopping the count. So imagine that we were going in a clockwise direction and we were now, uh, the dice said we're going to go 10 in a clockwise direction. And what would happen is as soon as the beanbag got to number seven, I said stop. And then the, because what I could see was happening over a period of time is the children were counting ahead to see who was going to end up with the beanbag. And so now let's take this a step further. So if you stop at seven, I've then got to count on eight, nine and ten. And so I can start to work out that ooh, it could be me. That's one thing that develops from it. Let's talk about another thing. 
after a while, children got a bit familiar with that. So let's just raise the bar a little bit here. And we start to build in the language of part, part, whole. Now let's relate this a little bit. So if we're going at 10 around the circle, that's the whole. If I stopped at 7, that's one part. And I've got to work out what the missing part is that gets us to 10. And so straight away, you could run that at different levels here. So a, pretty, a game that I had designed basically to develop the clockwise idea. That was what was in my head. Let's get this clockwise going. But at the same time, we're learning some counting. We're learning counting on and we're learning part, part, whole thinking. So it's really just developing that idea that helps us. So we start to see if we take those engaging principles that are mentioned there, the five principles of, the, of an educationally rich game, we can sometimes build. We might only have one or two principles, but as we add to it, we build to those principles. So that's just a thought, and there's a couple of pretty basic games. Now, just while we're on the topic of being a bit flexible, I'll just share one other idea. So essentially, let's take our same dice. So we're just using the pocket dice, and I just happen to have some coin pictures in there. Now, just to give you an idea, sometimes, and I'll just put it here to, to show you what I mean. So there's our pocket dice, and we just slide that in. Uh, and uh, we might play a game with money. So young children expected to recognise coins and uh, year two, for example, expected to count coins. So we could simply just roll this, collect the number of coins. Who's, after six rolls, who's got the largest total of money? So I might have got more one dollars and so forth. Now, sometimes you want to, the expression I use is run the children through the mud a number of times before it sticks. So you might have played this game and you might have used the pocket dice. Let me just modify the game and just show you exactly the same game. But let's talk about now moving them on a little bit. So I've got the same sort of idea. But if you look on the visualizer now, uh, what I've done is I've just basically put a spinner onto here. Now that's exactly the same as if I was using the pocket dice. But notice down here that now I've got a different representation that sits here. So I'm playing here it's slightly different to playing here when I do that. Now, here's the next bit. The really interesting game is when you get children one of these blank and they design this spinner. So straight away I can move to a different level. All they need is the circle and they can redesign that sort of thing. So here's just ways that you can build on this, maximize the curiosity, build that sort of thinking that would happen. So let's uh, continue on on our journey a little bit. And I'll just review some of the slides here. So here's another game. Now this you can download as well. Now, I call this Mary's game. Uh, the rules are up there. We're not going to play it in great detail, but let me explain it to you a little bit. Okay, so you're welcome to download this sort of stuff. And you need two dice for this. So I've just got my uh, two large dice here. But I just want to talk a little bit about where this might go and how it developed. By the way, people often ask me why it's called Mary's game. Uh, one was the real reason is that uh, there's a child in a class I taught many years ago called Mary, and that's where we started to develop and play this game. But the other reason I say is my mother-in-law's name was actually Mary. So it depends on which company I was in. So let's just talk about that game a bit. So I'll bring it back up on the screen for you to think about and look at. You're happy that basically we've just got 0 to 12 sitting on there. And there's two players. So there'll be one that's got 0 to 12. And yeah, you could do this uh, at home the same way. You literally write the numbers 0 to 12. And I normally might write one in red and one in blue. So there's two players. Now, when I teach this nowadays, because I've been playing this game for many years, what I actually do is get children physically up. So this game takes 23 students. And I put a, an A4 size sheet that's got 0 one, two, three, and I'll put it out in a line. And so you've got 13 students uh, this side, and then you've got 13 on the other side. So that's 26 uh, students. And then you've got a couple of rollers. So I normally put a two rollers at one end and two at the others. So that's, you know, we're now using a large chunk of the class, and then we have some observers. Now, here's where the game gets interesting. So I'm just going to roll a couple of dice here and just watch what I, what I mean, and we'll... Okay, so at this point here, I have a choice. So when I roll four and one, I could either say four and one is five, or I could say the difference between four and one is three. So I have an element of choice here. Now, for the moment, when I'm young, all I'm really interested in is practicing what's four and one, or what's the difference. But if we bring up the, the numbers again a little bit further, those numbers from zero to 12, um, this same game, could be used much later in the school 
for working out are there better choices. Now, if I take you back to the dice, let's just have a bit of a look at some of the things that develop from this sort of thinking. Okay, so for example, can you see there I've got doubles? I've got double four. So ultimately at this point here, um, most children will start to get the ideas somewhere around year two about doubles, and I've got double fours eight. But not too many children make the connection that every double in terms of difference is zero. So four take four is, is zero. For example, I've got here one and one. So one take one is zero or three and three. So any double as a subtraction will always be zero. Let's make one other little explanation. So we've got a three and a four here. You might be able to spot them. They're near doubles. We would call them near doubles. So we could do the addition easily, but think about sort of following this through a little bit. Any near double, the difference or subtraction is always one. Now, some of this is just sitting in the background while the children are playing this game. The key here is not playing once, not necessarily playing twice, but getting them comfortable with it so they're engaged, fostering that engagement, getting them to think. And then one or two, doesn't won't be everybody, one or two will start to make some observations. And then they'll ask, uh, sort of, I wonder if, I wonder if this counts for everyone. I wonder if there's a better choice. So for example, I wonder if, if I've got a double six, is it better to add it and give the 12, or is it better to do the subtraction? Now, if they've wondered a little bit and thought, well, actually every double I can use as a subtraction to get to zero, probably it's better to use the six and the six. Now, the, pro the probability or chance is beyond year two, but just building some of that curiosity gets them to think a little bit further. So that's, I think, an advantage of a game, not just for playing for the sake of filling five or ten minutes. I think it's worth us thinking about those five principles that we mentioned in that article. So let's continue on, otherwise time will sort of run away from us a little bit. So here's the key messages I just wanted to focus on at the moment. Okay, so engagement, we looked at the right at the start of the presentation. We looked at Dr. Catherine Adar's work. is not just fun. We can't say just because they're having fun, they're engaged. There'll be some people on what I might call autopilot. Yeah, I'm having fun, but actually maybe I'm not quite learning something. Um, that's where this sort of, you know, that zone of confusion starts to feel. It's pitching at the right point. Let me give you an example. So you might be able to play, say, noughts and crosses. But really, once you learn how not to lose in noughts and crosses, some of the fun goes out of the game, and it's not quite the same in that sense. So likewise here. The second point, remember, I made was we should be able to ask, well, that's a nice game, but where's the mathematics? So, for example, in the game where we were around the circle and we were, we were rolling the pocket dice, you notice that we were focused on the idea of clockwise or anticlockwise. That's what I had in mind. But that game then developed. We got the counting, the counting on. We got the part, part, whole idea. So it's good that I can start to focus on what it is, the element of the game that I want to bring out. If I'm focused then what that means is I'll be asking questions that build that natural curiosity. Yep, there's an element of luck and that's okay because I don't always want the smart child to win all the time. But here's a key point I'd like to really emphasize here. Games don't do the teaching, you do. Now, choosing the right game makes a difference. That's You have to match the game in the right spot. I often call it the Goldilocks principle that you might see there. Yeah, it was too hot, it was too cold, it was just right. So we need to find that. Now, what's the just right may be different from one group of children to another. And then we want to just take them that step further, that zone of confusion that we're talking about. Just stepping them in, not to the frustration point, but just to that next little bit. So that's where you come in. It's not just putting a game. The games are going to do the teaching. It's about you putting in place at the appropriate point. So they're the key messages I just wanted you to pick up at this point. Let's just take it a step further. And we we're talking about this idea of maximizing the, the, the thinking, the curiosity and so forth. So let's have a look at the next slide and you'll get an idea of what I, I'm talking about at this point. Okay, so we might now put a bunch of materials in place. So, and, and look, if you wanted a whole listing of that, put up, I've put up a website called Maths Materials and so forth. But I just want to take us into one of these ideas that sometimes just by having some material there, it can sort of help us to engage a little bit. So we've used some pretty basic stuff. We've used dice and we use dominoes and so forth. Uh, you might use dot dice and later on we can use 
and numeral dice and so forth. Now on the slide, what you'll notice is that I might have done some pretty basic stuff. I roll two dice and I've got a six and a one and I find the appropriate dice. So that's like a matching, a bit of subitizing, some of those sort of things here. So my first comment will be people say, oh, we want to use materials. And I, I love materials. I write a lot about it um, and so forth. But I need to be fairly clear here. If you're going to invest in a material, you want to use it a lot. So I'm going to do a task with dominoes in a minute. But essentially, what we're talking about here is making sure children are prepared. So I would have done an activity like roll the dice, find the domino and so forth. So let's have a look at where we're going to go with these dominoes. And I was going to put some dominoes on the table. Now, I might have done some other activities. So you'll notice the dominoes now going down here. I might have done, for example, the domino tower stuff. OK, so the domino tower is really you grab a domino, you get some uh, unifix or cubes, you build a tower that's the height of the number of dots. So the one you see on the slide happens to be five high and two high. And what you're building there is the notion that five is the larger number. Now, at sometimes children don't get it by height, so you might have to go by length, but I'm building which is the larger number. So imagine we played the dice game, it's got some subitizing and matching. We've done the domino tower. Now I'm sort of ready to really make use of the material. So let's have a look at a task, but we'll just go to the next slide first. And then you'll see what I mean uh, about that. OK, so we're going to do pairs to 10. Now, once again, in the material you can download, we've, we've written this up, so don't get too worried about remembering everything because we've given you some uh, write up about this. But I'm going to take you back down onto the visualizer so you can follow along. And I've got some dominoes sitting on this visualizer. Now, I want you to think a little bit of what we've been talking about. Now, we have a set of dominoes. There's not a full set there, but let's just talk it through a little bit. Now, this might be a task you may want to try uh, with your children, but I'm going to give you the language that happens here. We're going to talk about pairs of dominoes that take us to 10. Now, sometimes people go, oh, I'll grab a six and a four or a five and a five. But actually, we haven't met the criteria because I want pairs of dominoes. Now, for some children, the language can be a bit tricky. So is that a pear that you eat, P-A-I-R, P-E-A-R, or P-A-R-E? So it's not a bad idea that we uh, sort of write those words on the board and talk about what it is that we're worried about. So we want the pear, P-A-I-R, for this one here. And let's just have a look at our dominoes. And once again, if, even if you don't have dominoes, we've put some cutouts that you can make. If I grab this domino, then I don't have a pair. I've got a six and a four. To make a pair, I'd have to be grabbing another domino. And you can start to see there that it's six and four and zero. Yeah, that's a pair of dominoes. But that's a bit boring. So but that's a potential answer that we have. But let's have a look at another option that we might have here. So if I've already grabbed this domino, which happens to be six and two, OK? So I know that's a total of eight so far. And maybe I'm counting, but hopefully I can see the six and count on uh, seven, eight, then the one that completes that, doesn't matter whether it's that way around or this way around, okay, will give me a 10. So now that doesn't seem all that wonderful in the sense, okay, it's an interesting activity. Um, now, let's go back to my question. So nice game, nice activity, where's the mathematics? Well, now let's just pull it out a little bit and build that sort of thinking. Okay, so if we build this out, uh, we've got some subitizing, We've got some uh, things that add to 10 and so forth. But now let's really build this thinking. OK, so what's the total that we're aiming for? 10. As soon as I pick up one domino, so in this case here, do you remember I picked up the, the 6 and the 2? So I picked up 8. So that's a part. What am I looking, looking for? A missing part. So in this case here, if the total was, or the whole was 10, and one part was 8, then the missing part will have to be 2. So there you go again. This, this is part, part, whole thinking. And actually, we've mentioned that more than once. Remember the book? We had 12 ways to make 11 and so forth. There were two parts and maybe more than two parts. But now let's take this a step further. OK, so what we've asked for is pairs of dominoes that give me a total of 10. Well, actually, so far, we've got two because we had six and four with a double zero. Hang on, if I had five and five and the double zero that or the blank, that would give me 10. I've just got eight and two. 
Now let's throw this little challenge out there. Now once again, it depends a little bit on where your children are in this zone of confusion a little bit, because now we've got more than one answer. I wonder how many pairs there are that give you 10. Um, do you want to set some challenges there? And look, if you wanted to at some point here, stop and then think about that a little bit further, and you may even be playing with dominoes right now while I'm presenting, um, think it through a little bit. So is there five? Would there be 10 pairs that give me the total of that 10? Well, if we go back to here, I'm, I'm just going to just let you know, there are 31 different pairs of dominoes that give you a total of 10. Now, for some children, if they find two or three, that's doing really well. But you know, we're talking about this zone of confusion, this level of engagement that's building on. If it's too easy, oh, it's so easy, children maybe don't persevere. But if you start saying, well, do you think you could find 10? Well, can anyone find between you know, 10 and 20? Eventually, you know, if you've got one of those sort of children in your class, the Einstein of your class, you would say, well, how many do you think there are? And how would you know if you found them all? And so we're giving you this sheet you should welcome to download. Children can record their uh, answers and so forth. And maybe, you know, each day you say, well, now we found 15 different ones and, or 20 different unique solutions. Now, if you just want one extra little bit here, I'm going to let you know that we could have pairs of dominoes that add to 14. Okay? And guess what? There are 31 pairs of dominoes that will give you 14. I'm not saying that works for everyone else, but those two, there's 31 pairs that give you 10, and there's 31 pairs that give you 14. So it's just building that thinking. Now, if you follow the next slide through, I'm not going to do too much about it. This is just something you might like to try later. But you can see here, now we start to make trains of dominoes. And so I'll give you a little scenario for this. We're going to make a train. And when you make a train, the total number of people, dots, on that train will be 10 people. So once again, it's this focus of 10. We just did pairs that added to 10. But now if you look here, I've got a little extra bit. This becomes serious problem solving. So I've got a blank one. Now in real dominoes, you have to match. So you can see the one is matching with the other one. And then I've got a one and a three. And then I've got a three and a two. So am I getting there? Yeah. So I've got now, I think there's 10 dots. Yep, it looks pretty good. So there's an answer. Now, I could have a really short train, which is just six and four, or a short train that's five and five. This is a longer train. There's three dominoes make up this train. Now, same sort of thinking here. Now, it's a bit like that book we started off with, 12 Ways to Make 11. There's not just two parts partitioned here. There's multiple parts that are split or broken. Now, just for your benefit, I'm not going to give you the answer to this one, but I'm going to tell you that you can have short trains like the 5-5 five, five and the 6-4 and you can have long trains. The longest trainer that I can make uses five dominoes. One of those will be the blank. So straight away now for some children they'll get started. Now whether you call it you know low floor high ceiling, whether you call it multiple entry points, multiple exit points, what I'm looking for is the building of that sort of idea that happens. Now it just so happens, I'm doing a plug for MAV here as well, that I've just written about that in for the first issue of Prime Number next year. So if you're not a member or you don't get Prime Number, I suggest you do because I've sort of written about how to do that and you'll follow that, uh, be able to follow that next year. So that's the use of some materials and so forth. Now, I'm bearing in mind that we sort of, uh, you know, haven't got much time. So I just want to just take you through one other idea just to get some, some thinking here. Now, one is you'll recognize this name, Peter Sullivan, and I you know, can't recommend his books highly enough, but the one I'm using a lot at the moment is Challenging Mathematical Tasks. Now, I want to go back to, can you see my little analogy? I don't know if you know how a spark plug works, but essentially here, remember we've been talking about this zone of confusion, this notion of challenge and so on. Now, in a spark plug, the way they work is if the gap is too close, it won't spark up well, it won't fire well. And if the gap is too wide, it won't work. This is the tricky part for teachers because no two children or no two, this, the gaps are never going to be quite the same. You might get groups maybe that are similar. So this is the challenge for you as a teacher to try and build on the natural curiosity, to build in all the things they've talked about, the engagement stuff, the principles that are sitting there in the, the idea of uh, the games and so forth and manage all of this, particularly in a year like we've just had. 
but that's what the skilled teacher does, sort of changes that gap to make it fire, get the firing going. So let's look at an example from uh, Peter's books. And look, to make it easy, essentially I'm just going to take one example, but I suggest, I think they're, and it's an excellent book. So let me talk about the 15 counters problem. I'll take you through it fairly quickly, but if you had a bit of time later, it would make sense to do it. So you're going to need 15 counters. Pretty obvious. And look, ultimately you need to be able to count 15, and there's a bunch of things to happen there. I've got to know a one-to-one -one correspondence. I've got to know the number names in an order. And I've got to know that the last name I say is for the set. But here's an interesting, I'm going to show you some pictures and you see what you, you think. Okay, we have a look here. Some children might lay their counters out like that. So they've got three lots of five. That's fine. Let's have a look at another way they might lay them out. There's five lots of three. So straight away, there's different ways of showing the same idea. Let's have a look at another one. Okay. They might use an array, which is three rows of five or five rows of three. So see the language that's developing and I'm building on that sort of idea. Let's have a look a little bit further. Essentially, you might plonk them down. Some kids put them in pairs, so they're getting an odd and even sort of idea, one sticking out and so forth. So even just counting out 15 counters uh, is quite involved. Now, that's not the question. Let's go to the question that might happen. Oh, I forgot. There's the child that just plonks out 15 counters and they could be any old higgledy-piggledy way. But let's get to the question. This is straight from Peter's book. Basically, we have to distribute 15 counters among four people so that no one has the same number of counters. Now, what we're talking now is a challenging problem that's about at this level. Now, once again, I suggest that normally you would stop and think about this a little bit and some children will find an answer. Okay, so uh, one answer might be uh, one child gets one counter, someone else gets two counters, someone else might get four counters, and someone else get eight. So I've got one, two, four, and eight. And if you add them, that's 15 counters. And they might stop at that answer. But the really interesting thing is, was there more than one way to do it? And so once again, we could just stimulate that natural curiosity a bit. Now, uh, we actually have some of the answers there. Uh, there's one way of showing it, there's some others, okay, that's a different way of showing that sort of thing that might happen. Here's a way, I might be systematic. Uh, once again, we're going to make the slides available, so you don't need to sort of copy this down or whatever. It's just trying to show some system in what we do here and so forth. Now, I'm not suggesting that all little children are going to find every answer, but you know, finding more than one is an interesting thing. So you know, we want to talk about this developing curiosity. So I say, wow, is, that, is there another way you could do that? And you know, the sort of thing where you can jog children along and jolly them along a little bit and so forth. So just a, as a review of what we talked about here, we've got this idea of making connections, building this sort of thinking and so forth. We've got the idea of building on children's natural curiosity and so forth. So we put a few examples of what it might be. You know, can I make it a little easier? Can I make it a little harder? Can I change totals? Can I use different number of counters and so forth? And so essentially, after a while, we just get very familiar and it just flows naturally for that sort of thing. So we don't have to come up with the problems, which is we can focus on the teaching. There are a lot of good resources to do that sort of thing. So. Basically, I wouldn't think a little bit about what we've been doing today. It's really about maximizing where the children start. I really love this idea of just finding that sweet spot, as we call it, and fitting into that place there. I hope there's been a few sort of interesting things along the way, things that you might like to try. Hopefully, we've given you some resources and so forth that, uh, that might do that. But look, uh, I just want to thank you for uh, sort of persevering. It's not that easy in a virtual form. And hopefully there's been something that you can take away. We, we'll put the slides up available for you. We'll put the uh, support materials. You're welcome to download it. And look, uh, thank you very much for inviting me today to, uh, to speak. I certainly appreciate it. Brilliant. So thank you very much for that, Paul. That was wonderful. And um, certainly had me thinking a lot about dominoes. My children are going to... Um, be spending a lot of time with dominoes over the school holidays because I am definitely going to be investigating dominoes trains and seeing how many dominoes we can use to make 10. Um, so we did have one question in the chat box that came up and that question was about making the number 10. So the question, Paul, was would you count 6 and 4 and 4 
six and four as a total, and then four and six as a total as two different pairs or the same pair? That's a bit of a tricky question. What do you think? Um, uh, really what you're heading toward there is uh, the understanding of the community property of addition uh, or the turnaround stuff. Look, um, we're talking very young children here. So often what I try to do is give them some experiences before we sort of formalise that sort of thing. Yep. Um, one of the things you could do, so with the single domino, simply by uh, turning it around, you can see that one number plus another. Yeah. And so you know, people sometimes call that the turnaround facts, which is just really the, you know, the community property of addition. I, I sometimes use beads on a string, same sort of thing. So you can turn the beads around and so forth. I mean, ultimately, these are young children. So what I'm trying to do is give them exposure or experiences for that. And later on, what we'll do is we'll formalise it a little bit because um, I just want to give them uh, some common experiences. Now, clearly, if a child um, is pretty clear about all of those sort of things, um, then um, you can go a bit further with your individual conversation. It's a bit like I was saying about that sort of zone of confusion uh, in there a little bit. Ultimately, the teacher... That's why we. That's why we're paid the big bucks, so to speak. Uh, you know, uh, because uh, yeah, we've got to be able to see what what's going on and make some of those judgment calls. And look, sometimes we're not going to get it right. You know, yeah. it's, uh, same sort of thing there. Um, in terms of uh, the answers to the uh, whether there's thirty one, um, uh, th by the thirty one um, answers to the um, set of ten, I'll send you through those answers. So if anyone wants them, they can have them. Okay. Not before yeah, Christmas. Yes. Give me some time to play with that one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> and just to those people who are listening, please make sure you write any questions in the chat box because Ellen and I are monitoring this as we have a chat with Paul. Um, one of the um, topics and something that I have found quite interesting is that idea of play. So really opening up children in the early years, whether they've actually started school or they're doing your formal first year of school, which we call foundation, and even your one year two, the idea of play with a purpose. So I, you know, really like that idea of play with a purpose because of the language behind it, because there's a lot of parent and political input around, you know, people saying it's the afternoon of play. Can you think of any other good language for teachers to use to support their use of play within the classroom and perhaps get it across to a leadership team or um, a parent body? Well, it's interesting. Um some pretty famous people. I'm pretty sure Einstein's got a quote about, uh, you know, play being the child's university, which I yep. think is pretty neat. I like and and, and uh, particularly, they look, one person's play is actually another person's work. Yep. And I might think that seems quite crazy, but if you think about it, um, you play with some things and you move them around, you try various bits and pieces. So, you know, a lot of my work is actually play. It might seem unusual when I'm designing something, or creating something or building something, we're actually playing with that idea. Now, um, if you think about the models that people use in the, the world outside the classroom, they play with this, they test this, they trial this. So essentially when children are playing, inverted commas, maybe it's an unfortunate term, but um, they actually are working. Things are going on in their head and so forth. I guess the trick for us is to be able to recognise that and pull the bits out of this. For example, there's things like imitative play. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there, there are different types of play. So if you really go deeply into the play idea, there are different aspects to it. I guess the trick is, is as the teacher or, or adults, we feel that we've got to be earning our money, so to speak. So therefore, we sort of constantly intervene all the time. I think if we're switched on to the play, we can direct it a little bit. Um, and this really involves what I'm going to call strong pedagogical content knowledge. It might seem strange. We just work with young kids. But if we really understand that content really well, okay, then um, we'll be able to sort of pick that up a bit. So um, it's, it's a skill in working out where I sort of have my little two cents worth, so to speak, and where you let the children run a, a little bit. Um, yeah, I guess it's the individual notion. No, no, nature of children uh, and we need to work around it. Yeah, um, and so, uh, thanks, Paul. And there's a couple of other people that have suggested other words that they use in the classroom. Um, uh, Kristen uses exploration, 
and someone else has talked about investigation that's as well. And that's, and, oh, that's yours. <laughs> her, her, um, my daughter came home, her teachers may be watching right now, and she said, I'm so excited. This this term, and, you know, obviously our children have come back to school with a lot of mixed experiences at home. She said, this term, three afternoons a week, we're going to be doing investigations. Yeah. And my thought, I was like, yes, that's great, because I know what that means, but it's a good message to have across. Building on from investigations, Carmel has a great question for you, Paul. Carmel asks, could you please talk about a Oof. connection between play and reasoning? Oh, okay. So, all right, so I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a, a sandpit example for that one. Uh, but there's a couple of others. So, for example, in the sand pit, I might have some, um, uh, you know, materials like cups, uh, um, containers and all of that sort of thing. And, you know, one a bit of reasoning might happen that if I'm filling one container from another, the smaller the container I use, the more it will take to uh, fill that container. Now, that's serious reasoning if you think about that idea, that the smaller the unit, the more I need. Now, that's going to formalise quite a bit later in school. I mean, I'm not going to measure the distance from Perth to Melbourne in millimetres. I'm going to use a larger measure to do it. Uh, it's no different. Give me, I'll give you another example. Let's say we're doing something like, say, potato prints, you know, something like that. We might call it sort of a, a, an art sort of, sort of thing there. If I use a small potato, it's going to take more stamping to cover an area. If I use a larger potato, it'll take less. That's a pretty important concept to develop. Uh, in terms of that. So there are all different types of reasoning. And I don't want to get heavily into there's reasoning and there's deductive and inductive and all. Let's not get complicated the matter. It's thinking. Really what I want them to do is to be thinking while, they, while they're doing this play. Now, sometimes you just got to spark that by saying, well, I wonder what would happen if, and that's where the adult has to make the, the hmm, fine line between how much intervention so, so what if you tried this smaller container or you try this larger container without going over the top um, and taking over the kids' work? Um, and sometimes what you're providing with is, is the language with which to reason. See, many of these children can reason, but they have trouble expressing it because they don't have the set of words to it. So as the adult, you're providing a, a, a vocabulary underlying it so they can explain and talk with you. Right. Um, we have another question for you, Paul. Um, and I really like the idea that uh, from that previous question is that the teacher needs to, I suppose, linking in your even your previous answer, having that pedagogical knowledge, content pedagogical knowledge, knowing when to step forward and provide a leading question and when to let the student uh, um, explore and reason and then providing them with the language as needed. So going on from that, our next question is from Caroline and she is wondering... Should foundation students have a maths book for more formal recording of maths? Um, they go on to, she goes on to explain that she doesn't use one currently, but she's wondering what is the best way to record students' learning through games and hands-on investigations? Okay, so you know, I always need to be very careful how I answer some of these questions, but ultimately I'm going to make this pretty straightforward statement. I think the best sheet for recording is a blank sheet of paper <laughs> um, or, you know, a whiteboard, one of those sort of things. Um, first of all, you probably, when their children are so young, you're going to spend so much time filling things in or trying to fit things in boxes and whatnot. So I'd rather give them a bit of freedom. I think we're lucky today in that we have more access to digital ways to record. And I understand that can be a problem, storing stuff, finding it and so forth. Um, but ultimately we spend a lot of money in this country on uh, teachers making good professional judgments. And sometimes we sort of, uh, we're a bit worried about having everything to back these things up. We're professionals, and if we see something, notice something, I think it's fair enough that we, we make a call on that. Now, yes, you do need to have some artifacts, what they might be. I would think even a photograph, you know, three months later, I can't remember why I did the photograph. So you, you have to have some annotations and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Plus, when you're little, three months is a big time, you know, uh, to develop there. I think if you wanted to specifically point something out, you may even have a small recording. So... Um, I've been playing with some things called rainbow recorders. They're pretty neat. They'll record about a minute of children's um, language. Uh, and But, you know, it's keeping all of that. And, and so record keeping that's involved. So 
probably I wouldn't want a book per se. I might want a place where I'm going to keep some artifacts and that might be glued into some sort of, you know, a scrapbook type thing and so forth uh, without going down the, the route of having uh, too much stuff because it'll date pretty quickly over a year because these are little kids, they're going to move fairly dramatically in that sense. And look, uh, it's easy for me. I'm sitting here not working in a classroom and I'm always aware that guys like me can make these big blanket statements, right? But it's hard work and it's hard work with these young kids and we will make some mistakes and some of our judges may be wrong. But, you know, doctors don't always get it right either. So, you know, and, and sometimes they consult. So we need to be prepared for that sort of thing. Excellent. Um, and I absolutely agree. We've had a few people saying they use scrapbooks, um, which is obviously a really great idea, but just being a bit flexible and agile. And Paul, really, you know, that analogy of the pair and the pair was a really good thing to come back to. So that was great when we were talking about that. We have a question um, which will throw you a little bit under the bus, even though I'm sure you'll be fine to do it, um, given this is talking about the early years. What type of games would you use for students who are moving into high school or moving towards high school, so the year seven level? Okay, well, I guess if that, that might be a loaded question in the sense of are they working at that level? Yes. It would depend on, on what games they might be. Um, well, I'm going to plug one of my own games, so and I know yeah. <laughs> where it might be, but I, I really like the game Roco. Yeah. Uh, I just see it's got a lot of uh, strategy involved in it. Uh, got integers, you know, positive, negative numbers. It's got words like rows and columns. I think it's nice to play with parents. I, I noticed when the sort of whole COVID thing was on, I did a survey of parents and, and some said to me, well, we only actually got one child in, in, you know, and so forth, haven't got two to play. I think it would be, you know, it's a game that would go for 10 or 15 minutes, not overboard in that sort of thing. I, I quite like it. Um, but I think there's a lot of other really useful uh, commercial games. Connect Four is a nice game. Battleships mm -hmm. is a nice game. All of them are the appropriate level that would sit there. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, also, we need a bit of a break. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, probably yeah, a bit difficult for. I mean, you guys have had it much tougher than we've had it in Western Australia. So. Yeah, there, I guess there's a few people who want to catch up a little bit, but the reality is you're not going to be in the same spot, so let's not try and be there. Um, yes. I think um, someone said there was they were going to suggest Broco, which is a fantastic game. And, yes, my children, I've got one in year eight and she still enjoys Broco. Yeah. I love Rummy Cup. That's one of my yeah. favourite. Yeah, right. like Rummy Cup too. is a great game and I'm addicted to it online. So I'm a little bit past year seven level and that still <laughs> is fun for me. Um, well, I, um, I think that's it for our keynote this morning. Paul, I'd like to thank you so much on behalf of the MAV for your time and your keynote this morning. Um, we're going to take a quick break now. We will resume. The next session is at 10.25. In the meantime, uh, some of you have asked in the chat box about where can you procure... I'm not going to get Paul's uh, resources. Funny you should say that. This is your perfect time to go and check out the, uh, the Mav Shop. Um, on the left-hand screen, you should see Mav Shop. There's um, many of Paul's goodies, including Roco and Combo, um, games for the Year 7 area, um, uh, child-friendly playing card games and cards, and some of those, I believe, may also be in the specials, uh, uh, special conference section. So um, go and check out Mav Shop today. And also while you're there, don't forget to also touch base with the sponsors and the exhibitors in that section as well and um, uh, connect with each other, connect with the exhibitors and connect with um, presenters. So once again, Paul, thank you for your time. And um, I yeah. hopefully we'll see you face to face sometime soon. Oh, we'll be, uh, yeah. Well, and we'll, maybe, be, we'll, we'll be over there. Yeah, hopefully we'll be over there. <laughs> and if you stay on in this room, you'll stay with us. And I think James Tanton is coming up for a room one next. That is correct. So we will see you all at 10.25. Or actually 10.23, we'll be ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.